Hello, my name is Anya Andreeva and I'm a graduate student at FIT University in the textile and fashion studies in the conservation track for textile conservation. This here is my uh, project for the third semester conservation course. And the course was about picking a garment to uh, work on all the issues that, that it has, um, conserve it and report, do a report at the end of the semester. When we went into the um, graduate study collections to pick out the garments, I saw this coat and I really fell in love with it. And the reason being is that I'm um, a seamstress by profession and so I really enjoy working with coats, especially 1920s sort of early teens and then going into the 20s coats because they're so decorative, they're so full of artistic um, endeavor and creative um, investment really and expression. So this coat really jumped out at me and I jumped at it and um, I was allowed to work on it. Of course, at first, um, it was really the outside, the decorative aspect of this coat that drew my, atten drew my attention to it. As I began to look inside and explore it, I was discovering um, very interesting um, making solutions, so the embroidery aspect of it, the tailoring aspect, the choice of materials, as well as issues that were connected with those choices. Um, but to begin with, I um, wrote my report on this code, estimating that it was possibly the early to mid-twenties, considering the length um, of the hem, and if I do what this lady is doing and stand slightly kind of on my toes, you see that the coat's length is below the knee, so we're not really at 1926 yet when the hems are jumping up, so this is the earlier version. And going through some of the sketches in the Spark collection, I also saw similar designs with the split, um, you know, the split decorative um, sleeve here and also the uh, decorative bands going around. Uh, the contrast in lining and uh, the outer shell. So these are elements that are representative of the 1920s. So this was um, the damage that I was looking for to literally to take care of in this coat was partially expected and partially surprising. Uh, when uh, I, what, for, for what I knew about the silk textiles of the time, sometimes we encounter weighted silk which is silk that was degummed and then because it becomes lighter in the process of its making uh, one way to make silk heavier is to add certain solutions that add salt into the um, into the fiber making it heavier and because silk was sold uh, by weight this was essentially you know it's a marketing strategy it's a you know selling strategy so however the salt causes damage just plainly speaking to the fibers and oftentimes it's a damage characteristically uh, noticeable by splits vertical splits and just very defined splits in the textile which is what i found in um, this the lining of this uh, this coat as well as its decorative panels so the green signals issues basically everywhere we see green um, it's it was a problem the black silk satin is very much intact on this coat, which was really a blessing because it meant that the coat has some, something strong um, to, be, to be, first of all, to allow me to handle it more confidently, but also to be able to um, sew into where you know, stitches were required. So this was really estimating the strengths and the weaknesses of a garment, and I thought of it also, I was talking to someone relating this to another conservator who was my teacher in the program and she said it's much like a person, like a character, you know, their weaknesses and their strengths and so you use the strengths of the, uh, to play off to the weaknesses but then you recognize the weaknesses, you see where they intermingle. So this was very much like that, it was discovering the character of this garment um, because as I discovered sometimes things that look strong in a garment are not necessarily strong the things that appear to be weak may have some hidden strengths in them so this is always uh, really a meeting like a person and this garment has a character and it's really in the rather attention you know paying attention being detailed about the uh, examination um, and really looking closely without making assumptions about the garment that allows one to see into the detail and to be able to devise a strategy of conservation. 
So this is how my journey with this garment began. Um, I did not expect it to be as extensive and we didn't know then about this exhibition that was about to take place. So this was purely a class project in the beginning. However, uh, I believe that this code deserves the attention that it's getting right now and hopefully more once we get past COVID and can do a real exhibition. So because and the reason I say this is because it is representative of the era like I said it's a evening coat this would have been worn over a dress uh, all the colors are you know the peach was very uh, popular at the time the black of course the green was there as well but you see all the decorative embroidery here and it reminds us of the exoticism uh, movement at the time which was always there was latent but became really prominent and patent in the 1920s and uh, when I was doing research on this, and again, research for conservation for me meant knowing the garment, knowing what it needs, and making sure that conservation will not alter the original intent of the uh, artistic aspect of this garment. Uh, these, so in my research, I, I thought, you know, this, this reminds me of something, these little flowers here. Um, I've seen them somewhere before, and this is how it starts, and I thought, you know, India, this reminds me of the Kalamkari technique of printing on cotton, and just recently I just held that thought, it didn't prevent me from doing conservation, but I didn't go further with that, and just recently I was listening to a conservation conference on um, Indian textiles, and sure enough, comes up a little motif, nearly exactly that, and it's from the I believe it's in the Washington State University Museum, I could remember, but I believe it's the Kotzen collection. Anyway, and they were talking about it, and I thought, huh, there's my answer. These textiles were popular. Um, of course, there was a lot of, you know, trade was happening, and people had access to these um, exotic textiles already, and since it was a time of really kind of using and using all the available sources on design, uh, they were familiar with the design, and I believe this, uh, again, I say I believe, I don't have proof directly, this, this, what, this is where it came from, but it's just very close, very, very similar in shape and design to that. Um, the embroidery itself here is done in two, well, there are several threads involved, but two of them are metallic, silver and gold, which is not apparent from, the, uh, you know, from a distance, but when we get closer to it, we'll see that um, that's what was used, along with the uh, embroidery floss. So this was done by someone who really knew what they were doing, to say the least. This was uh, someone very proficient in their embroidery skills. Um, interestingly, there was a moment where I was e examining the code and I was wondering, well, what do I expect to find in there? Again, coming from a seamstress background, um, I tend to look for certain things or I just, you know, I wonder what, what was the seamstress, what was the, what was the tailor, the maker of this garment, um, what kind of strategy were they following? And it was, uh, I, I was really satisfied, I would say, to find some things that I really did expect in this code, and they were very straightforward, simple, uh, professional uh, ways of constructing this code. Because you see, it's very fluid. This, this code is meant to be, well, I don't want to yank at it, of course, but it's it's, um, it's a code that's meant to go drape over the body and have a flow. So as the lady is walking, the, the silk would be reflecting the light. Um, there's a shimmer on the embroidery. So this code is meant to live with the body. It's, it's not intended to be sort of, you know, a stiff um, code by itself. So in tailoring, of course, we need to strengthen uh, the collar. To say the least, there has to be some strengthening at the hem, maybe to keep the shape of it, but also there's so much embroidery, something has to be backing it up. So um, I was expecting, I was wondering what they used, and they did use indeed a very thin uh, cotton interlining in the collar stand, and it's a scrunched down collar, as we can see, that it's meant to sort of have some weight to it, it's not stiff standing up. The same material was used to back the embroidery, and it, the embroidery actually goes through the silk and uh, through, you know, not through the lining, but through that interlining inside, and that's it. There is no other layer here. So they kept it really as thin, as fine as possible, but ensuring that the embroidery will last, and it's, it's a coat that could be worn for several seasons, obviously, especially considering all the work that was put into it. The lame fabric and the use of a metallic thread 
point to really the a higher price point of this code. Now I have not, again, this is another thing where as a conservator I put a note to myself, uh, more research is necessary, more research would be, um, you know, would really add to the body of knowledge about this garment. However, I have not ventured that far into the research itself. All I could say is, uh, always the more handwork there is in a garment, the more, uh, the higher the price point would be. Uh, of course, this could be potentially somebody exploring, uh, you know, making garments on their own. There were people who were very skilled at the time, and hand skills were, were still, um, you know, prominent. However, there's a, there really is a feeling of professionalism about the way it's done, even though we're lacking a label, which is that point where we can say, well, it was done in a shop, it was done for a client, private client, or somebody made this for themselves, somebody who knew how to use the needle very well. Um, the body of the code is constructed by a machine, but all of this is, of course, handwork, and it's extensive, so someone had to have known what they were doing, because if if not, they'd be still making it, you know, and this is 1920s. So, um, so yes, there was that question of, well, who could afford this um, and who made this? I do not have those answers, but this is what, looking at a garment um, inspires those questions to really dig further. The garment is now on the table so that we can explore the inside and the details of conservation work that was done on it. And first of all, I'd like to mention that conservation is not restoration. And something that I really had to define for myself through uh, my recent conservation work is that it's not rejuvenation of a garment, but extending the life expectancy of the object. Uh, and with that being said, and the reason why I wanted to point that out especially, is there are certain expectations that are placed into conservation work. And that is, we're trying to preserve what is there. It is not necessarily a return to something that was original. It is not a really minimal intervention, whatever is the minimum necessary work to extend the life expectancy of the garment. And here it becomes really important because uh, I had to make some decisions about keeping the evidence of the era. And I wanted to um, get from that point into the really the, the decision about the, the lining of the coat. So as I mentioned before, this little buttonhole here was loose. And it seems like a simple enough thing to just attach the, the loop, make it functional so we can close the coat. Of course, then comes the question of well, how, to what extent can we even rely on this button to, to really be able to contain the coat and to really function the way it was originally intended? Is it strong enough? And this is where I had come to discover that the lining of this coat, the original lining, and I will just give you a glimpse of it, we'll return to that in a second. The lining was extremely fragile and every time I touched it, literally, it was shattering more. So it was really a question of understanding, getting a very good strategy about uh, preserving it intact because every time I was touching it, it had the potential of getting more deteriorated. So what do you do in a situation like this? It's a touch it, it's bad. Don't touch it, it's bad. What do we do? And of course, that had to do with the closure here. Now, if you can imagine that when you look on the outside of this garment, it looks quite clean, intact, it really looks solid. It looks like you can actually put it on, potentially. Now, of course, you see this um, lining here that is conservation lining. What you don't see, but we can peek at, is here, and this is where you know, I will, I will do this because the top lining can be manipulated. It's a new stable uh, fabric. But if you can see inside, there's a lot of damage. There's a lot of shattering. You can even see that here on the hem. This is what's happening to the rest of this fabric. It is so fragile. It really does not lend itself to much manipulation, touching, let alone putting stitches in. So there's really no way to, um, to handle it in, in an obvious way. So attaching the loop became a problem because I could not sew it into the outer garment that would leave a mark and the lining was completely uh, shattering. So suddenly a small issue became a big issue and became an issue of, well, what do you do with this whole inside that is completely unhandleable? If we cannot handle, uh, conserve the inside, that means the rest of the coat, no matter how stable it is, 
cannot be used for display. No one can really handle it, see it, except when it's in a box, on a table. So what do we do? The top portion, the collar area, was also shattered. It's a separate piece. The lining for the collar is a separate lining. So that was really the area that I thought I would use the new textile on because it potentially would be visible on the mannequin, as we saw before. You could see the inside of the collar. I was devising a different strategy for the rest of the lining. And that was uh, where I thought, okay, the most direct approach should be um, the best one, you know, the simplest solution sort of to get to that point. Okay, so I've, once I've dealt with the covering um, with net of all the green element on the outside, I came to the inside, uh, to the lining of the coat, and we use, we have a method of placing adhesives, so basically putting, a, using a very fine uh, fabric with adhesive on it under the shattered textile that can potentially create the solid substrate that the shattered, the weaker fabric can be adhered to and therefore act as one, so it's a reinforcement. That was the most direct approach I could think of. Yes, I'll just put enough patches with adhesive underneath the lining, um, use, use heat, press it in, it will adhere, it will act as one. Wrong. Did not work. So what started happening, and this was, you know, you test a little area, little area, it was, it was fine. Of course, keep in mind, this is me as a student and not somebody who's been in the profession for a long time. Um, I tested on a small area and it, the two layers seemed to work fine together. When I started trying to get inside the coat, I thought, well, how do you get inside? The lining is closed. As you can see, this is all stitched. And there are holes, there are ribs, but it's stitched lining. Finding areas that where the seams were shattered and allowed me to get in was a part of a solution. So I was trying to get in. Then I noticed as, as soon as I would put in the adhesive patch, there would be a new tear or a weakening leading to a tear somewhere next to it. And this was really the alarm that was going off and more of a tactile recognition of the issue of weighted silk, of the issue of fragile silk. Really, it's one thing to know it, but every garment will act differently. This method would have worked maybe on another garment, maybe something that was more loose, that didn't have so many attachments, so many seams pulling at it. So the adhesive strategy did not work. What do you do now? Well, what I, what I did then was go through all the other smaller issues to really get more recognition of the garment. And I find that to be important that first I prefer to deal with things that are straightforward, that are really clear, smaller areas maybe, that are not interfering with a bigger solution because that allows me to handle the garment, let my hands recognize what it needs. There's a lot to be said about that. Let the eyes get used to the stitching, to the fabric, the weight, because there's a lot of information that gets processed by, by that kind of, by just the handling. Um, and so the mind just gets informed about the, the garment at hand. And solutions can come up simply from that observation. So I decided, okay, let me try the collar. What do we do about the collar of the lining? What kind of lining do we choose? Well, it had to match the green, uh, you know, the original garment. And this is where it's really a question of what do we do? Um, do we try to match this exactly? The exact match would be ideal, which would mean finding a comparable uh, silk um, textile, like this is crepe de chine, and dyeing it to match exactly the color. Well, within the scope of the program, I didn't have such resources, uh, you know, technical or time-wise, so I decided to go to the garment district that we are blessed with having here. And B&J happened to have this lovely color that was as close as I could get to the original color. The idea was at this point, um, well, let me just jump back of one second. I was looking for the textile to just replace the color um, lining because that would be potentially visible on the forum and I thought well the rest of it um, maybe there's a different solution I'm not sure what it could be so when I got this textile again it was washed it was processed the way that we prepare textiles for conservation purposes I saw that the color was not the exact match but I thought there's enough evidence of the exact color remaining in the garment that I'm not uh, altering the artistic choice of this I'm not 
uh, imposing my decision on the decisions of the era that, again, is important to preserve here. Once I, done, I had done, made the pattern for the collar, um, I saw the insides, I delighted myself in the skill of my you know, colleague from the yesteryears, and that's always a delight to see. This was covered. Well, the thing about being a student is that you, more than anything, I learned to, to make mistakes and to recognize mistakes, of course. And once I've attached the collar, I thought, well, I still have to do something with the body of the lining. Um, I was still hoping to do something with the adhesive um, substrate, maybe just in a more, in a wiser way, find another way, maybe just was hoping for some, for a miracle <laughs> of some decision making, I'll be honest with you, that doesn't sound very um, much like a strategy, but really I, I didn't, I wasn't sure what was the best solution. Once I've attached the lining I, to the collar, I saw that it was quite successful, it was doable, you know, because we have this, um, edge here that we don't have a facing so you know the green is seen when it's on the garment on the form once I've attached it I thought okay this does not um, appear you know to be um, in any way changing the look of the garment you know it's clear that it's conservation it's not again pretending to be the original it's obvious that this is conservation work which is also important that we're not putting something in um, without a trace, without recognition that this is conservation, this is not the original material, this is not to be mistaken with the historic evidence of a garment. I thought, okay, so this, and it's reversible, it's also important that this can be taken off if somebody found better fabric, somebody's researching, somebody possibly will conserve this better uh, in the years to come, will have a better matching uh, textile, perchance, they, this is easily removable. The stitches are um, quite easily removed. So I was satisfied on those accounts. Once I saw that that worked, I realized all of this. Oh, and by the way, with as careful as I was with handling this, the gar the lining kept shattering. So the more I was conserving this, uh, the worse it was getting, and there was really no way to avoid touching it. And every time this lovely edge here um, was handled, which is impossible not to handle it, even just to open it, to work on it, the edge of the garment here, the lining was just shattered, so it was going with a long split that was not, I, I realized I cannot fix this. There's no way I can put a needle through this textile, it's too fragile, it will not hold a stitch, the adhesive treatment <laughs> keeps putting more tears in, what am I going to do? This is where um, I realized that the only solution would be to replace the lining. Now, to replace the lining has two ways of doing this. And, of course, now that this is covered, I cannot show it to you, but the shoulder areas are completely shattered. The stitching is completely shattered, and large portions of the sleeve lining are simply detached. And there's, um, it could be secured, now that I look back on it, that it could have been secured to the outer uh, seams. At the same time, my solution was to simply contain the inner deterioration, which was really not, it, it, there, there was no way to really secure it to the outer shell without leaving some sort of a mark or potentially leaving a mark or potentially creating some pools and I didn't want to risk that. My idea was to contain it inside as it is, that lining, to preserve it for future generations of researchers and conservators, but allowing uh, for there to be a barrier, a safe barrier between the mannequin and the garment so that this coat could be displayed in an exhibition. And that's really, and, and the, so basically this lining is acting as a bag containing, you know, as that protective layer where you can lift it up. This is why the hem was, I left it open. It was also another decision to make, do I just keep it closed, which means nothing, you know, there won't be any threads, you know, coming out. At the same time, that means putting more stitches into the lame fabric, which also is relatively stable, but has a degree of fragility that may may not, you know, dictate that sewing into it may not be the best solution. And then I realized that for ease of research and um, access to the original lining, I will just leave it open and this way you can see exactly what the color is, exactly what the fabric is. There are plenty of, if anyone ever wanted to 
uh, research and look under the microscope at the fiber, um, fibers, you know, the silk fibers of this lining, examine it. This is easily done with very little manipulation of the code. So that was really the thinking that went into it. Uh, also, it protects the code from shedding when placed on the mannequin. There might be small uh, pieces of fiber. This is just something that, you know, this, this deterioration is kept in check somewhat, but it is ongoing. This code will not get younger. And uh, that silk textile will potentially keep splitting because if the code is moved or just, you know. But at least for the purposes of using this in the exhibition, this contains somewhat the shattering and the shedding of the fibers from the lining. So that was the decision that I had made about placing the new lining in. Of course, with the color being slightly different, again, we are not misled to believe that this was the color chosen by the artist. We can easily see that this was the original choice, provided, of course, this may have gotten discolored slightly and, you know, as it aged, but at least we know the difference. We know this is conservation. It is not a restored, it is not pretending to be the original uh, lining, which was important. Now, there were also several splits in the lame fabric. That was just something um, that was using conservation stitches that was kept in check. Once I had the, the fresh lining in, I could secure the ties, and this is the original tie, and this is the conservation tie. Again, in a way, having a different color here allows us to see the difference, so that we know what is the historical textile and what is the conservation textile. Very important point. The Keeping the edge was um, somewhat difficult, and um, because there is no facing, so it is a, just a flat edge. Once I had the fresh lining, I could finally attach my loop so that this coat could become, uh, you know, could have a functional closure. And again, this is how a small issue leads to uh, really a bigger solution, sort of a bigger problem. And this is how all the parts act together. So the loop itself is strong, but strong as it may be, it could not be attached to the fragile lining. And this is where that whole interplay of elements come together. Uh, the inside that I, you know, I can actually show you like this. A solution for the sleeve, because I had left this, the arm's eye open um, for further decision making. Again, I ran out of time. I went way beyond the time, the scope of the class uh, work on this code. And so I, uh, as I kept the code, uh, you know, we, I took the garment home when COVID began and I had it there. So I had time to think and really review my strategies now in preparation for this. And I thought there's got to be a good way to keep that shoulder area intact so that it doesn't get abraded when we put it on the form. So uh, a full length sleeve was not something, sleeve lining was not something I really wanted to do. Again, this, this may or may not be the best decision. However, I felt that you know, splitting as this may be somewhat in the area. This is not an area that carries any weight uh, the way the rest of the lining does. It's on the edge. It can be conserved given the time and the resources going forward. It is minor and this is the area that we see. So in a way this area on the sleeves was, was much like the green trim that I was hoping to preserve the original color in and I felt was important so that it really plays off one another. The inner lining, we don't really see. We see a sliver on the edges, maybe. This is more of a decorative component in this case. So yes, it is lining, but to me, there was a difference of the decorative component, like the, the trim and this area of the sleeve, um, different from the, the inner lining. And of course, um, there was a thought also that the lining, that is inside and the lining on any garment is intended to be replaceable originally because it is the lining that protects the outer fabric from the body from any abrasion and it's intended to be something that might get destroyed and replaced so in a way this goes with the general tailoring concept of uh, how a garment is constructed that has the lining inside this is also protecting, but this is really more on the decorative side because there is a split. If this was just a, um, a whole sleeve, I would consider, you know, replacing it. However, this is intended to be seen, so 
we're talking decorative, we're just hoping that it survives longer. Um, th thankfully, the embroidery was very well intact. It did not need any conservation. The peach colored uh, silk has some weak points. However, like here you could see they were minor and I realized that trying to fix them would probably cause more deterioration. So this is a case of if it ain't broken, don't fix it or don't make it worse. And really one has to stop oneself. It's sometimes difficult to stop when you have a needle in your hand and you're just going for every little split and hole. And this is where sobriety, you know, conservation sobriety has to kick in and say, no, nope, don't touch that. That is not um, as fragile. That can be just left alone and any kind of interference might result in, in damage that would be worse. So I left it alone. A few splits here and there were in the um, stitching. Now this is done by a machine and it's top stitched with tiny, tiny stitches using a black thread that is splitting in some areas. However, overall the structure is quite intact. Um, this was fixed just by slip stitching sometimes going into the holes that were left by the machine needle originally, just not to create new holes, and generally we try to follow that um, methodology of just using the existing holes uh, from the machine stitch. And they were tiny, so that, that meant tiny stitching. Now, the half sleeve, as I explained, is protecting the shoulder area, and hopefully, um, puts a, enough of a barrier between the garment and the mannequin. So now that we've gone over the whole coat, and of course there are small details and little anecdotes that I could tell, but for um, you know lack of time, and there's always, there's always a new discovery once you start touching the garment, so nothing is apparent uh, completely in its entirety right away. Like I mentioned, it's all about um, taking time, and again, there's a limit on that because when you're working, of course, you need to keep in mind the time that you're spending on it, but really it's a meticulous observation of every detail and how it all interplays that allows us to make the best, the best decision that is available currently. Again, that is not to say it's the absolutely best decision, and I would be glad if um, after, you know, once I'm, I am done with this, but if future generations of conservators come up with better decisions, this is what we're trying to do here that our conservation work is reversible to the greatest extent possible so that someone with a better idea can come in and do a better job or, or that the conservation does not uh, really take over the garment in the sense that it can never be separated from it again. It has to stay separate. It is um, you know, assisting the life of this garment. So what, do I, what did I learn from this aside from conservation? Um, as a seamstress, as a fiber artist, for me this was a great joy and delight to really handle somebody's masterful work. And I learned from it. It doesn't form uh, my aesthetic taste. It builds me up as a maker because whenever we handle something that's done with such grace, with such professionalism, I believe, of course, we enrich our library of knowledge. Um, and it's really an apprenticeship that I would call this. For me, conservation is really an apprenticeship with people who have come before me and were making something that is masterful, uh, that were expressing their creativity, and I'm learning from them. This inadvertently happens. Again, I come from a background of um, you know, being a seamstress, so for me, every seam is significant. I look at all the details, I notice them, I read in a way the garment like it's a, it's a book about the maker, it's not just about the garment. Of course it is the wearer also that is important here, let's say if I was more of a fashion historian I would probably uh, be paying attention more uh, trying to imagine like who would wear this, what were their choices, what was the fashion taste, and that is all part of conservation as well, but it's interesting how depending on our um, professional bias, our uh, professional background, what each conservator brings into this work and what becomes significant. For me, definitely the construction of this, and um, I actually have a sketch that I have made that I will, would like to bring in. As part of the FIT program in conservation, we had to take a class where we were, we were um, doing sketches of garments. And I chose this garment. We could choose any garment and do 10 sketches for the class. 
I decided to sketch this code out because, again, in sketching there is a recognition, there is a, um, a reconnoitering the land, kind of the landscape of this piece, and many details are noticed once you start, you know, sketching and trying to capture all the details. So this was the, um, the sketch of his garment with a layout of a pattern. The pattern that was used for this may have been generic, um, it's quite interesting to study. Again, this is a part where I would say further research would be necessary. So if I wanted to delve more into that, that's another departure point for, for more um, knowledge, for more research. Overall, I would say uh, when I was done with this um, conservation, I thought, well, what would I have done differently? And I realized it's a very important question to always be able to ask is, because at the end of all handwork, there's always this feeling of, oh, well, if I was doing this now, I would do this differently and that differently. And I believe that's part of it. It's really recognizing what would have been done differently. Well, I would not have been doing the adhesive treatment. I can definitely say that. That is something that I believe I have acquired by experience working on this coat. That was my guinea pig, in, in a sense. <laughs> Um, that going forward, I would recognize when a textile looks the way this lining looked like, just leave it, just do not apply adhesive or at least think um, you know, of alternative uh, methods before you know, looking to that. Some other things um, could be, of course, the construction of the lining, maybe the application, the choice of text. I would have loved to find a textile um, that was, you know, may maybe to dye it closer to the color. Um, considering that it's obvious it's a second lining, so yes, it is conservation lining. It's not pretending to be the original. And it would have been an interesting experience. Some other areas uh, have to do with the way I conserved these outer decorative panels, where looking at them now, I realize I could have put in more conservation, conservation stitches where there are some split um, edges and I was just being cautious not to put in too many um, or trying to do this in time to submit it at the end of class, I have to admit. So in looking over that, I, I'm thinking, well, maybe I could have, I would have dyed uh, small pieces of the same textile to match this color better and to really do more underlay that went under the net. So basically, match the color better instead of uh, putting stitches over the splits, just put a whole fresh new um, piece of fabric there, dyed to match that original color. That is something um, I, would have, I, I would love to have done. However, that would have required more experience and I did not have that at the time. So that, uh, I'm sure there are other points that in the course you know, of me working with garments, I'll probably think of and go back to the code saying, oh, I wish I had done this. And I'm really looking forward to, to such realizations. And this is the story of how I met this code and how we became friends.